letting all the folks in the room. It's kind of fun always to watch this and to see some names that I know and some names that I don't know. And we're just really glad you're joining us here today. And in just a minute or so, maybe not even that, we'll start going. Uh, yes, okay. Well, hello everybody. It's, uh, it's great to have you with us today. And I'm so glad you've uh, chosen to join us for this uh, webinar uh, we've called Living on the Encore Curve. Uh, my name is Mark Roberts. I am the uh, executive director of the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. And one of our key initiatives is called Flourishing in the Third Third of Life. And we are excited to help folks in this season of life, and that's sort of 55 and over, more or less. We're really excited to help folks uh, flourish, both by experiencing personal well-being and also by making a difference that matters in the world. And we really base our work on Psalm 92, a part of which says, the righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age, they still produce fruit. They're always green and full of sap. So we have this picture of folks flourishing, producing fruit, even into old age. And we really believe that that is something God has for us. One of the things we do in our third third work, in addition to creating resources and experiences to serve people, is we try to help folks become aware of uh, really crucial ideas and excellent resources. And today's webinar will do both of those. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce to you Andy Robb, whom I first got to know through his book, The Encore Curve, and you'll learn more about that in just a minute. Andy is a financial advisor, a life coach. He's a sought after speaker, Bible teacher. He's a member of the staff of Highland Park Presbyterian Church in Dallas. And if that's not enough, he's also the author of The Encore Curve, Retire with a Life Plan That Excites You. And we'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Uh, in addition to all that he does for work, Andy is married to Jean. They just celebrated an anniversary. What was it? 53 years, I think. And uh, they have five grandchildren. Let me just say one more thing, and then we'll jump in with Andy. Uh, if you, we will put links in the chat for various things. So if you're looking for how you get to Andy's uh, book or, or website, we'll have that. Uh, if you have a question for Andy, a little later in this webinar, we will have a time for Q&A please put your questions in the Q&A space. If you look at the bottom of Zoom, you'll see Q&A. So you can put your questions in there and that's where we'll get them. So I think that's, uh, that's plenty for now. Andy, uh, thank you so much for being with us. We're excited to have you here. Uh, welcome. Hi, Mark. Um, I'm so glad to be here and so excited to do this because as you were going through that Psalm 93 passage, that is something that is so near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. that we continue to produce fruit in, in our later life. And it's so yep. critical in this yep. day, day and age. So uh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you. You know, Andy, for folks who don't know you, uh, uh, could you give us kind of a 90 second summary of your life? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it seems sometimes like that's all it took to get here. So uh, <laughs> uh, as you said, we uh, celebrated our 53rd anniversary yesterday and uh, we were, we, knew each other for six months and got married and keep extending. So it's working out really well. We have uh, two grown daughters who live near us, uh, not too near, but kind of near, and five grandkids, uh, four of whom are in high school or college. And then our youngest daughter, uh, the Lord called them to adopt a baby from Child Protective Services almost five years ago. And she's just been a, such a delight. And uh, so it's it's been a great family. Um, I, uh, we've been in Dallas most of our lives. Jean was raised in Oklahoma and I was raised in Indiana. But uh, just from a uh, educational standpoint, I have an MBA uh, in finance and uh, I also attended Dallas Theological Seminary and uh, spent about 10 years in corporate finance before I started my own firm uh, called Rob Capital Management, which is a financial advisory and investment firm. I'm actually 75, I soon will be 75, so I'm still going, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm turning most of the work over uh, in my 
practice to my partners and we're, I'm not really taking on new clients at this point in time because I feel like God is calling us to do some other things. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, two, a couple of things. Gene says that I, uh, if, if you can do something, then I can always find a way to do it to excess, which is an issue <laughs> in my life. But uh, I'm also uh, part-time on staff at Highland Park Prez. Uh, in Dallas, and I'm in charge of uh, generosity and stewardship and, and the financial messages there. And uh, I teach at least one or two classes, Bible study classes a week, which uh, is really my passion. I love mm. talking about the Word of God. Mm. Uh, all of our kids and grandkids know the Lord and are active in their church and active in ministry. So we're just uh, even, uh, we're thrilled and, mm. and really blessed. So that's kind of a condensed right. version. Well, uh, thank you. That is a good condensed version. So let's just jump right into the middle of this. Uh, sure. The Encore Curve. What is the Encore Curve? Well, uh, maybe if uh, Abby could put up that first graphic, it would be easy to show it. Uh, I don't know if she has it, but the idea here, as <clears throat> I work with clients and, uh, and thought about this whole retiring process myself, uh, I realized, go. there we go. If, if you look at that curve, uh, I realize that a, an interesting thing happens in people's lives. And this is, I call this, uh, engineers will know this as a sigmoid curve, but it's a personal progress curve. And over time, this is what our life would sometimes look like. Uh, when we start out like my kids in, in, in college, uh, it kind of takes really a downward or a flat as we're trying to figure life out. And then we begin to get, most of us get life figured out and we begin to have an upward slope in our life curve. Uh, but at some point in time, and generally it's around the time that we begin considering retirement, we run out of, we begin to run out of steam, either energy or uh, health wise or something throws us into what I call a decline curve, just a natural decline. And the idea behind the Encore Curve is at that point of downward deflection, I believe that we can reach in to scripture and into our life history, our, our personal wisdom, and develop uh, with a process that I have a new upward sloping curve that I call the Encore Curve. And it's the idea, first of all, that as we get older, our past naturally, by virtue of years, becomes bigger than our future. But as most of us get toward retirement or my age or mark your age, uh, we, be, we begin to visualize our future as becoming compacted and smaller and not quite as appealing, especially as retiring. And so um, I believe that uh, we can go through a discovery process with some specific tools and create an upward sloping curve into retirement, into what you call the third third, so that we can flourish, maybe being even more impactful, even more empowered than we were in the first two thirds of life. And so that's the whole goal. And that's where the idea of the Encore Curve came in as a, as a deflection point from the, uh, what I call the decline curve. Right. So, uh, and so that, that, that graphic is good because that, the, the one with the decline curve is the way an awful lot of folks think about what it is to get older, right? Your, your impact is going down and you're going to have health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you're saying it doesn't have to go that direction. And that's exactly what I'm saying. I had uh, lunch with a friend of mine two or three years ago, uh, and he was the, uh, he had just retired as the CEO of a big organization. And we talked about his trips that he was taking and his golf that he was playing and all these fun things that we think of as retirement. And then he got quiet and looked at me. He says, Andy, you know, I, he said, uh, when I was working, I felt like I was somebody and I was doing important stuff. And now I just simply don't know what I'm doing and I'm not doing anything important. Yeah. And so what I'm finding is, as I talk to people and coach people, is that we become uh, less and we feel like we're becoming less and less significant the older we get. And that's a really bad place to be. So uh, yeah, that was the idea behind that. Yeah, it, it is. As you know, and you refer to this in your book and you know the research that folks who really don't have purpose 
uh, actually don't do well. They're not as healthy, they don't live as long. And, and so there really is a, a decline curve. But as you're, as you're saying, you don't, you don't have to be on that curve. There's a, a different option. So there, book, there is, absolutely. So your book has basically two main parts. And, yep. and by the way, folks, uh, we'll put the link up if you want to buy the book. I, I, this isn't, is, 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 Andy's not doing this just because he wants to sell books. I, no. I approached him <laughs> on it, but I, but I like the book and I think it's, it's well worth reading. The first part is a life plan that excites you. And then the second part, a money plan that lets you sleep. I love doing it that way, lets you sleep. Uh, let's talk about the life plan. You start there. Okay. Uh, a lot of books on retirement start with the money. You start with the life plan. Why, why did you start there? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, being in the retirement business for the past 35 or 40 years, uh, I look at uh, what's happening in America and I realize that we're flunking retirement. And by that, I mean that everything is money focused. Everything that we hear about retirement is save money, get a good rate of return, and then you can just live on the beach and never have to worry about life and, and so on and so forth. And that's really not, it's, that's, a, uh, that's a false narrative because there's two main focuses on, and that's why my book has two main focuses. One is about money, obviously, but the other is about meaning, about significance, about, uh, and that's where people get discouraged. Uh, they fear uh, that they're not, they're just gonna run out of meaning. And so what I wanted to do and you mentioned both sides, Mark. I think it's, it's critically important to, before you worry about the money side too much, you've got to worry about the why. Why am I investing? Why am I saving? What's my why? Uh, Simon Sinek did a great uh, uh, TED talk on, on getting to the why. And I think that's part of my passion is helping people discover their why. Why am I, why and, and how am I going to do this? And so, um, I think you've got to have that before you can adequately address the money side. So yeah, that's great. And coming from a financial planner, that has some real credibility. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, one of the things, and you've just sort of referred to this, but in the book, you talk about how really paying attention to our personal history makes a difference. You've got a chapter called The Past is Prologue. Yeah. Uh, tell us more about that. Why does our past help us to know kind of where, the, where we might go in the future? Well, uh, two or three things. First of all, in, in Philippians 3, Paul says, forgetting those things that lie behind, I press on. And he's giving us a three-step process. And I've developed a whole other little thing around that. But he's saying, forget the past, focus on purpose, forge ahead. So those three steps. Uh, and I always like to, uh, 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 the great theologian Tarzan of the jungle. Yes. Okay. Fine theologian. So, yeah. So how did Tarzan get through the jungle? Well, he grabbed a vine and he swung to the next vine and he swung to the next vine and he transports himself through the jungle. But what happens if he doesn't let go of the last vine when he reaches the next vine? Then he's, as, as I say, here I am stuck in the middle with you. He loses all momentum and he can't get anywhere. And that's what I see people doing because as we get older, as I said, our past becomes bigger than our future to us. And so many people live either a life of regret, if I'd only done this, if I'd only done that, if I'd only done this, or they, uh, you and I both know guys who, their glory days were when they were the high school quarterback and won the, uh, or the, the, the state championship. And so, so many of us, as our future begins to shrink, we expand and live in the past. And we, we find that over and over with people. So what I want to do is give people tools where they can make their future bigger than the past. And a good way to look at that is um, I use the illustration of a backpack. We all have a backpack that we carry around with us. And uh, into that backpack, we throw all of our experiences during our life, all of our failures, all of our successes, all of our whoopies, all of our yahas. And you get to be uh, 65, 55, 75, and that backpack is really heavy and you're dragging it around with you. And the point is, where is there a rule that says that I have to drag everything in that heavy backpack into my future? So the idea is to take that backpack off and with a 
process that I, I've kind of coached people through. Take all the stuff out of the backpack, or better yet, take the things that are worthy of empowering my future out of it and figure out how to use those tools, my wisdom, and I'll show you the GPS system in a minute. Take that out. There's only so much stuff that's worthy of empowering my, me into my future. Leave the rest of it in the backpack and go throw it in the corner. If you got to go pick those regrets up later, you can go do it, but, uh, but uh, you know, keep moving. And so that's, mm. that's the idea behind, behind the past. Uh, and uh, and that kind of dovetails into uh, my what I call the GPS system is the process, and I'm, I don't mean to. Uh, to no, you're 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 pushing us in the right direction. Before we get to the GPS, though, you just mentioned wisdom, mm -hmm. and I found it interesting yep. in your book that you have you know two different kinds of wisdom and different values in them. Uh, what you call earned wisdom and learned wisdom. You want to talk about that because I I find that a, a very interesting distinction. Well. If you want to go Google wisdom, uh, many people will find a spectrum of uh, data, uh, knowledge, information, and wisdom. And what we find is at the data end, data changes now many second by many second. And data is an emotional attachment. In other words, I'm looking at the stock market as an example. Oh, it's up. Oh, it's down. Oh, it's, it's data. And so it has no value. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, there is wisdom. And there's a, the Bible says a lot about wisdom, but wisdom is something that's very stable. It doesn't change. And so as I was studying this, I realized that we have, if you will quote in a secular term, we have our own personal wisdom. It's my experiences. And that's what I wrap the GPS system around. How do you pull that out? Uh, it's, it's my experience in this world. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me, earned wisdom is something that I earn through the school of hard knocks. Those are only lessons that I personally can appreciate and understand because I went through it. Some people go through that all their lives, but that's what earned wisdom is. Learned wisdom is going to somebody who has wisdom in a certain area like you do and learning from them and then incorporating it into myself. And uh, when we learn and use earn and learned wisdom, it's kind of like, uh, you know, at the airport, you get on that, uh, that track uh, where you're walking and you get on the, the moving sidewalk and you move three times faster than by walking. Well, that's what learning your own wisdom does for you mm. when you can, and it just empowers you forward. And so uh, in the book, I did not put that in biblical terms, but, but you certainly can easily. So that's the idea, what I've learned versus what I've uh, earned. Well, I, I love that distinction because it certainly got me thinking about, you know, so what is my earned wisdom and what's my learned wisdom? And, you know, yeah. and, and that both count and they're different and you can pay attention to both. And I love that. So yeah. let's get to Thank this. You. Let's get to this phrase encore GPS. I, 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 it's, okay. I love the GPS part. You know, if you, if you had written this book 20 years ago, you probably would have talked about a compass or a map yeah. or something. Yeah. And nowadays people don't have compasses and map very much. We have GPS. Yeah. Um, t tell us about that. And I think Abby also has a graphic to, uh, she does. And that would be helpful. But here's the idea in a nav system or a GPS, it really does two things. It tells you, it tells you where you're going, but it also tells you how to get there. It shows the, 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 the quickest way or the easiest way or the alternative ways. And so I created this, this idea and put it into my coaching program. And if you'll see these three concentric circles, and I'll explain what each is, but uh, it's giftedness, passion, and standards. And we have certain things in each one of those that we can identify. But what I found was when we begin to put those together in the, and, and create the, or determine what's in the center, in other words, um, what is consistent with all three of those, that really helps us direct and, and create that encore curve. That's where the empowerment comes from. So let me give you an example, uh, giftedness, and I have uh, some worksheets and things that people can go through. It's really defer determining 
what am I best at doing? It's not necessarily spiritual gifts. I know all about that. That's not what I'm talking about. It's what am I really, really good at? And what am I really, really lousy at? Because a lot of people spend their whole careers being forced to do things that they're really not very good at. And so we have a process of, of walking people through a questioning process of what am I brilliant at doing? And because we know that he, we can only progress as people when we're focused on our strengths and we rarely progress when we're trying to overcome our weaknesses. It's just, that's a loser's game. Then the P is passion. So giftedness is what am I great at doing? The P is uh, what empowers me? What uh, do I love doing? What are the things that I would rather do than anything else? And in retirement, that's where most people kind of focus on. And frankly, most people don't even know what their passions are. So we have a questioning process for that. And then the third one is standards. And that really is, uh, what do I believe? What's the most important for some people? It may be politics. For some people, it may be church. For some people, it may be uh, it could be any number of things, but we break it down into our core values, and we also break it down and, and who is most important. Uh, so the giftedness is the how am I going to be empowered. Uh, the passion is where am I going to focus that power, and then the why is why do I want to do this. So let me give you a quick example. I'm not doing this very well, but it's uh, it's. It, I love to, I'm, I'm really good at writing and I'm really good at creating uh, ideas and things and, and teaching. So uh, my giftedness would be in that area. But my passion is to, uh, to share the gospel, to share Christ with people. That's one of my passions. And my standards have to do, one of them is I want to make sure that my grandkids are equipped for this next world that they're facing. So when I put those three things together, one of the things that pops up in the middle is writing devotions and sending them to my grandkids. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I like to say I do that. I'm not very consistent at it, but that's an illustration of how these three things work together. And we have a process that helps people define what those are and then define how they go together. And, uh, and I've found when people can do that, uh, they really get empowered. And if I could take just another minute, I have sure. a cl client and good friend as, as a good example. And Chris retired and he loved to fish. So that was his passion. He fished. But uh, he went fishing for the next year and came back to me and said, you know, I'm really bored with this. What do I do? Well, he was uh, he was also a gifted teacher and mentor. And one of his standards was being in the military. He had been from the military. And so as we walk through this, he as a result, created or got involved with a ministry that takes wounded returning vets fishing and mentors them. And so he's out one or two days a week doing what he absolutely loves, taking one or two young guys and buys them fishing material and, and stuff. And, and, and they go out and fish and he talks to him. He builds these relationships and builds these into these guys. So he's doing all three. And that's a really good example. So that's a great example. It reminds me actually of a a friend we had when we lived in Texas, he actually was our realtor. And uh, as we got to know him, he had been the CEO of a pretty major company and he retired in his early sixties. He loved golf and he just figured he's yep. going to play golf. And for about three years, he played golf and he got almost to scratch. I mean, the guy was a great yep. golfer. And after three years, he decided, I, you know, I'm bored. <laughs> and so he thought about what he wanted to do. And he said, well, and it's sort of he didn't have your model exactly, but it was kind of like that. It's like, I well, like what that. am I gifted at? I'm, I'm good working with people. I'm good with, you know, sales. I'm good with negotiating. Uh, I, and, and his passion was really serving people. So he became a realtor, not, not really because he needed to make a bunch more money, but really he loved helping people either sell their home or especially he loved helping people find the right home for them. And he was a great realtor for us uh, in this so his encore curve was was a, another career, if you will. Uh, but it was, you know, if he'd had your schema, I mean, that really would have fit him. And yeah. uh, it's a great way to great way to think about it. So I, I love well, it's it. a tool and, and it, then it directs us where uh, where we want to go or where the Lord leads us. But it gives us a tool to work with. You know, one of the things you, you say in your book is, is you, you really do think that for those of us who are in this third third of life that in one sense our, our future can be bigger than our past 
like, what do you mean by that? And why do you think that? Well, it obviously can't be bigger. Okay, so I'm 75. And so my future is never going to be bigger than my past. I hope not in terms of, of years. <laughs> I don't see that happening, especially when my back feels. Um, but it can be bigger in terms of, if you will, density or in terms of impact. Or if you think uh, you can grow a schematic and show your past and your future in terms of volume. And I think if we take, and that's what I'm trying to do, get people to take their experiences and figure out how can they make an impact in uh, when Jesus talks about the parable of the soils, you know, uh, he talks about four kinds and only one fourth of the people uh, that, that hear his message, but they go out and produce what 30, 60 or 100. That's impact. That's density. That's importance. And so that's what I mean. Um, and so like your friend, he went out and he impacted people's lives in ways that he never would have in his career. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in, in retirement, we have a saying that in retirement, there's three phases. There's go, go, there's slow, go, and there's no go. And one of the things I found is if you don't get the go, go right, uh, because the clock is ticking on that mark. If you don't get the go-go right, you've used up a really significant part of your empowerment and you get into no-go and slow-go time where Gene and I are starting to get, things get a little bit, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go well if you don't have that right. So it's a, and, and you're, what you're also sort of alluding to is that it, there isn't just sort of one kind of experience in what we call the third third. I mean, it's more like the sixth, seventh and eighth, ninth or something, but, but that would be kind of awkward. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, and so you, you do talk about money and obviously you've, you've thought sure. a lot about this, but you, your uh, section is on a money plan that lets you sleep. Now, I think I know exactly what you mean, but you want to say why you put it that way? Well, uh, that's what most people want to do. And uh, I have all my clients are retired or virtually all of them. And that's their big thing is, am I going to have enough income to do what I want to do today? And will that income last? And uh, if we can answer that, then we can sleep better because most of us, frankly, uh, sometime during our life or most of our life, we wake up at three 30 in the morning. That's what we worry about. Oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to run out of money. And this market's going to cry, you know, all these and so money is an incredibly emotional uh, thing to talk about. And it has incredibly emotional baggage attached to it. And so uh, if you look at, I, you, I think one of the things you asked me earlier is what are the two, one or two biggest ideas in terms of money? And if I may, let me tell you what I think they are. And it comes with two words. One is mountain and the other is buckets. And so on the mountain side, uh, all of us, if you, if you think about climbing a mountain, that's what we do while we're working and we accumulate. And we're always adding to uh, our retirement reserves, hopefully, if we start early enough. So we're accumulating, we're managing rate of return, and we're going up this mountain. But um, uh, we are told research says that for mountain climbers, the most dangerous part of the mountain is the one third, the top third, the one third when you going to the very top and then coming back down. Actually, more lives are lost on the way back down than they are going up, mm -hmm. which is really instructive to us as retirement planners. So as you come back down, uh, you're not adding anymore, you're taking away and you turn to risk management. And you don't know when that terminal, uh, when, when am I going to cash out? So I, Gene said, I want to spend my last dollar going to get an ice cream cone at Brahms and then drop dead after I eat it in the parking lot. I mean, that's a perfect world, but it doesn't work that way. So we don't know how, how long that money's going to have to last. So, so one of the big ideas here is that we need to understand that retirement investing is entirely different perspective than accumulation investing. And so that's mm. the other idea uh, is, is the idea of buckets. 
And that is, um, and I've got some in the book and in, in, in the process, I've got uh, some worksheets, but um, all of our money is not the same as when we retire. We always think of it in one big ball, but it's not because our expenses are not the same. There's basically two kinds of expenses to be real simplistic. One is essential. I know that every month, dollars, this, this amount of dollars is going to go out for the things that I don't have a say-so of. Uh, health insurance, uh, taxes, you know, and, and utilities, all the things that I need. So there's this, that's locked in. And if there's a way that I can create guaranteed or almost guaranteed income like social security that will offset that locked in expense that goes out every month, then that's when I can sleep at night. You know, if I know that I'm, I, I, that's just good, if that's going to happen, then the other bucket is in the discretionary. And those are the things that we make a decision on. And mm -hmm. so then we have to begin to plan what, what kinds of things do I make a decision on? Is it stuff that I simply want or I, do I need it? Uh, is it now? Is it going to be an emergency? Is it later? Uh, these kind. So that's where the decision making comes into. Yeah. So it's really that's really helpful. Uh, I have a a few more questions, but let me say to folks who are uh, joining us in this webinar, if you have questions for Andy, uh, please put them in the Q and A. You'll see a little Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, and if you click on there and put in some questions, I'll try to uh, uh, represent them and and give them to Andy. Uh, so, but while you're thinking about that, I, I want to maybe just ask you a few things that are a little more personal just to get yeah. to know you, but also your life story. And, and so in this season of life for you, what, mm -hmm. what are some of the highlights? Like really, what are your, uh, where, where are your joys in this season of life? Wow. That's a, that's a really great correct question. And, uh, I wrote Jean a uh, Christmas or an anniversary card yesterday, and part of it said that uh, what is romantic today is different than what was romantic 30 or 40 years ago, in, in many ways, and that's true for all of us. Mm. Uh, obviously, our joy uh, comes from two or three places. Obviously, uh, our relationship with Christ. And uh, we find now in this stage of our life that we're spending a lot more time uh, in the gospel, studying together, doing things like that than we ever did when I was, uh, you know, working 80 hours a week, or whatever it was. So we have, we have a little bit of uh, the ability to do that more. Mm. So that's incredible. And that helps each of us grow. Mm. Uh, I think the second part is our ministry. We're both actively engaged in, in, in several ministry kind of things that really uh, we may build into them, uh, but it builds into us a lot more. Mm. Uh, and then thirdly is obviously our family and just to see our kids and our grandkids grow into a relationship with the living Lord is mm. unbelievable. Uh, I, and, and many people I know listening have that relationship and many people probably don't. We have a lot of friends where their kids don't know Christ. And so that has just been a huge, huge blessing. I don't know if that's, that's the answer to the question that oh. you're asking, but, uh, that's a great answer. You know, I'm impressed that you talked first about relationship and then you talked again about relationship. You know, you're, you're probably aware of the, the Harvard study of adult development. They took Harvard students right around 1940 and followed them for literally 70 years. And one of the things they were asking along the way is what is it that really, what, what in, in, at age 50, what is true of people who then at age 80 are doing great? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. The, the big answer they came up with, to quote the, uh, the, the director of that study, he said it's relationships, relationships, relationships. In fact, if you have a solid marriage at age 50, that's actually a better predictor of health at 80 than good cholesterol, as it turns out. I think and, you're right. Uh, and so yeah. it's just, uh, that's just such a, I, I appreciate your, your doing that. You know, we're getting some questions. So let me go ahead and, and ask okay. them if we're getting in here, which, which will sure. be- Okay, so uh, what mistakes have you seen people make in thinking about retirement? And and name names and tell us, no, don't do that. Just what mistakes? Um, well, from the money standpoint, uh, waiting too long to accumulate and not using the power of compound interest and not having a plan. 
I think, not having a plan because uh, in, in Joshua, when Joshua led the Israelites across the, uh, the river to take the new land, uh, God raised up the ark and he said, look at, the, look at the symbol of God. And he says, then you'll know which way to go since you've never been this way before. And for all of us moving into later life, moving into retirement, we've never been this way before. And, uh, and so you, you were talking about earned wisdom versus learned wisdom. Man, go lean on people that have been through it, whether it's a financial planner, whether it's somebody else. And don't listen to just one voice. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the voices out there want to sell you something when it comes to money. So be really, really careful. But have a plan and don't wait too long because yeah. you can't recover. Yeah, that's great. You know, I'm sure you know there's research that shows that really a, a, a frighteningly large percentage of people who are retiring have no plan at all. They, they, yep. they, maybe financially they thought a little bit, but about their life, they've thought no. pretty much nothing. And uh, so you're saying that's one of the big mistakes and that makes a lot of sense. So well, have a plan on both sides, the life uh, and the, yeah, yep. absolutely. Because one feeds the other. Yeah. So uh, a, a question here, uh, uh, looking at, at Jesus, so our Lord had a very low cost lifestyle and that enabled him to focus on ministry to others and mission. In the third mm -hmm. third, how do I determine what amount of comfort and convenience and consumption are consistent with my faith? Great question. Tough question. What is it? <laughs> so you got to go on. No, yeah. we got to go on to the next question. I can't answer <laughs> Okay. How do I determine? And th that is a really tough question because uh, I know multimillionaires who would answer it the same way as somebody that has $5,000 in their pocket. Um, so it is, I think it has to do with being on your knees, being open. Uh, again, I, I'll go back to this understanding your wisdom and understanding what is God leading you to do. Now, God is not leading me. We've been reasonably financially successful, but we give away a lot of money. God is not leading us to go to voluntary impoverishment. I don't see that happening. He could, but that's not our makeup. For many people, it is their makeup. So you have to be honest with who you are and, and, and so on. So uh, uh, I don't know that uh, I'm we're, we're teaching through the life of Christ in John right now, and we're seeing Jesus do incredible things, but he didn't come to show us how to live impoverished lives. He came to show us how to live abundant lives. And that's an entirely different thing. Now, to some people, that equals one equals the other. But uh, I, that's, that's not what I see. So I don't know if I'm addressing that. Well, if not, then email yeah, me and it's, ask yeah. me some more. It's a great start. It actually somewhat, I think, may even relate to a, another question, which is, um, is living the Encore Curve a solo quest? Or is there a community dimension to this? And no, there is absolutely a community dimension to it. And I think community dimension is critical. When we, when we do our workshop, uh, there's an online workshop or people go through it. We say, do this, sit down and do this with your spouse. Do it with somebody else because community is incredibly important. Uh, let me go back to the, the, the previous question too, because it's... Um, what I will find, and this may sound uh, harsh, but I will find that some people in later life who have done a lousy job of planning and saving assume that they are destined to be in poverty, and they assume that that's their lot in life, and they will, and that becomes their cross to bear. And it's not necessarily because God was leading them there; it's just because they made bad decisions. So uh, I don't mean for that to sound harsh at all. And that's not always true, but, but that's what I'll see sometimes is people will say, oh, I'm, I'm this way when really it was just a series of bad decisions. So interesting. So here's, a, here's another good one for you. Okay. Uh, this person says, I'm 66 years old and married. Both mm -hmm. my husband and I are retired, me within the past year. I find myself missing the significance of my 44 year career and I've identified passion, strengths, and values, but find myself shying away from commitment out of fear that I'll be bored. It, it, mm. it's like I don't know what to do with the freedom I have. Feel guilty if I'm not doing something. Help. 
Love that question. <laughs> this is an incredible question. And I suspect it could be said by about half the people on the thing. That is a great question. Um, um, let, me, let me think through a couple of ideas. First of all, throughout scripture, we are told to keep moving ahead. We are never told to backtrack. We are always told. And so I have a little saying that the, next, the way to find God's will for my life is to do the next thing on my plate. And sometimes I have no idea what that is, but if I've made a commitment, go do it. And uh, secondly, as we explore new things, we learn new things. And, you know, you kind of go, well, okay, that didn't work, but I learned this or I met this person. And so I think uh, the Holy Spirit is always pushing us to get out there into community, into involvement and never sitting still. I mean, that's the, that's the model that I see in the Bible from so many, many leaders. Mm. Um, but it, it's an incredible question and I'm, uh, I'm not I'm talking off the cuff and not giving it a really good answer. I would love to explore that more. Uh, I have uh, on my website, I think you can download it, but if you can't, I'll fix it so you can, um, a little booklet that I wrote called The Five Biggest Retirement Dangers Money Can't Fix. And the last one has to do with relationship reset. And this may be what she's talking about also, in that a lot of people that retire find that they don't, uh, they and their spouse are not fitting together well. So when you retire, all of a sudden you lose the cocoon of a job that has distanced you, did you from your spouse. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to reinvent your marriage because you say, oh, well, who are you? I've not seen you before uh, without looking at you through my job or my career. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's a big process. So. And, and there again, that's where if we're living that in community and not just by ourselves or only with our spouse, we've got others who can sort of share in the journey and, and, and bring that learned and earned wisdom that they have. Uh, yeah. uh, but, it, you know, it's interesting because I think long ago or not that long ago, people kind of thought, well, there's a lot of development and growth in your personal life and in your relationship early on. And then you just kind of hit this plateau. And what you're talking about is so true that so many things change. And, you know, I think of my, my pastoral experience and looking at couples who are going through retirement and some were like, they were almost like a, they were on a honeymoon. Like it was a new, exciting season of life. And, and they were, yep. and then others were just hardly tolerating each other. And, and I, I think to be aware of those transitions is really wise and, and, it, and it's, it's helpful. Let me, uh, may, I, may I interrupt just a second and uh, give you a startling statistic, and it's coming home to roost right now for us, and that is that men over 75 have the highest incidence of suicide, right. and the reason is lack of community. Women tend to have more be community-oriented. Men isolate themselves, and when they walk away from their careers, they become more and more isolated. We just have two of our dearest friends uh, a week and a half ago, both lost their, their wives, their spouses from cancer within 24 hour period. And wow. these two guys are now lost and they have community around them. Thank heavens. But, uh, that is just an incredible danger that, uh, we need to talk about more and, and yeah. solve more. So uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right. So the research shows that, uh, as you say, men in particular, but not only men, but men in, more than women, Tend to be isolated. Isolation often leads to depression, and then depression can can lead to suicide. Yeah. And you know that's again. There's so much that's surprising about older age, both in terms of people's capacity being much more than we might have expected, or as you say, uh, this this relatively unknown experience, at least wide in the wider culture of of isolation leading to depression and, and even suicide. So. Yeah. That's, um, well, well, let me ask you, because this is could be somewhat related. Somebody asked, so how does the pandemic affect any of this stuff you've been talking Oof. about? I know. <laughs> You're getting that. You, these are not like softballs, chest high. These are no, these that's OK. Good well, pitches. I don't think it does. Move on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it, it, it I think two or three things uh, for all of us. The pandemic has affected us because because it's diminished in some ways it has diminished our community. Uh, we're, 
in, in some ways that's been true. People are isolated, especially older people who are uh, not healthy. So it has diminished their community enormously. Uh, for many of us, it has actually increased our community. I feel like Gene and I, even though uh, we don't see people as much, we thrive because uh, I'm teaching online. Uh, I know the class, the Sunday morning class I teach is two to three times larger than it was uh, when we were doing it live. Uh, so there, there's, there is that. And, and, you know, just praise God for technology, even though we may not like it. Uh, so it has an enormous impact, but I think that then the question is, what can I do personally, me individually, to reach out to somebody else? Mm -hmm. uh, we have, as an example, we have a dear friend who every morning she sits down and writes notes, little tiny notes in this beautiful handwriting to five people every morning. And you get a note from Sue Ann, and it's like you, you're somebody singing a song to you. So how can you do that? How can you pick the phone up and call somebody that you know is in need uh, and not just gossip, but have it be a ministerial call? Because that's something we can all do is be ministers. And that's what we're called to be is ministers to others. So uh, even though it shrinks down, OK, this is a good example of the Encore curve. We're shrinking down in one way, but we can use it to expand in another way, if that makes sense. Man, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, what you, you one of the things that I think has been really hard in the pandemic for me, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sort of a, a teacher of a Sunday school class at my church. And most of the folks in the class are 15 or 20 years older than, than I am, or 30 even in one case. Okay. Uh, and we have lost in the last few months three of our most beloved and wonderful people. Yeah. You know, we can't, we didn't have a memorial service. I mean, I'm in no. California. You just can't do that. And, it, 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 so that's really hard. But as you say, but I've, I've used the phone more than I probably would have uh, to, to connect with some of these folks. So I, I just, I, I appreciate so much what you're saying. My uh, wife, Jean, leads a ministry uh, that takes meals to people in our church who are getting out of the hospital or have had babies or in desperately. And they, they'll do five or 10 meals uh, a week and have uh, people that deliver it. And uh, they're just making a huge impact. So anyway, go, I'm sorry, I interrupted you again. That's all right. I got it. And uh, I'm going to do one, one last question because I think this is just great to tee up, you know, the the, the larger significance of the work you're doing. Because I know you're absolutely about helping individuals to experience an encore and, and live on the encore curve, but you're also about the larger significance and, and difference that it makes. So the question is this. Uh, we now have the largest number of retired but still capable church members than ever before in the history of the church. How can the church step up to enable those capabilities for the kingdom and not just for personal accomplishment? Great you, question. Buddy. It is a great question. I know you and I have talked a little bit about that, but that is probably the, the biggest thing on my heart right now that the Lord is putting in my heart mm. is... Uh, it's this that, and I, I wrote a, anyway, in church, in a church environment, the quote, quote, senior ministry has always been to the elderly uh, in, in an outreach scenario, in planning trips, doing fairly impassive kinds of things. And that's just great. But we have a new group of people, the baby boomers that are coming along, 10,000 every day, turn 65. This baby boomer group doesn't want to be passive. They want to be, they've been active all their life and they want to be empowered. And churches, I don't know, uh, I only know of a couple of churches that are really actively engaged in, and I know that's just what you're doing, Mark. How do we create a, an empowerment ministry within a church? Uh, and, and it's really twofold. How do we, and I would love to have my GPS and all that be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually rebuilding this in terms of spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. But how do we do that? And then on the other side, how does a church create or generate areas of service? So not only do you have to wind people up and, and head them off, you got to have a place for them to do, to go. So it's, it's not an easy uh, one shot fills all kind of a thing. But that is, I think that is critical for this next generation, because um, 
the baby boomer generation can empower and impact people for the next, I, I mean, just go to the, the 30, 60, 100 times. One person mentoring a group of, uh, of a half a dozen uh, young men you know, over, over lunch once a month, if nothing else, or what my friend Chris did with the, with the fishing, with the, uh, the so, so there's an incredible potential here that I don't think churches are tapping into at all. I think they're ignoring it at this point. So well, as you that's my, that's my, I love that. And as you know, that's, I mean, that's that. So in, in my GPS, that's part of my passion is, is not only to help individuals flourish because there's so much potential for individuals to have a much richer and fuller life as they as we get older but the uh, the, the potential impact for the church and beyond and that's why you know I go back to uh, that Psalm 92 text it talks about the righteous flourishing but it says in old age it will still produce fruit so it isn't just in old age they'll have a great life it, it's they Ooh. will still be productive in, in, and that so I just, I feel like we have the most extraordinary potential. Uh, we now, I'm thinking Christians and the churches. And, you know, and you mentioned the Dupree Center. One of the things we really are committed to is, is teaming up with churches, helping churches. Uh, as you know, Andy, we even have a, a partnership now with your church, yep. Island, Park Presbyterian Church. And we're looking to just... And, and that started because I was talking to one of the people on your staff who works with your senior folk. I just said, you know, what can we do to help you? So we are really committed to being a part of this process. But I, I'm actually excited about this because I think there is a great yearning in people for meaning, significance, for making a difference. And, and churches are beginning, I'm finding, to wake up to this, to the fact that they have within their, their congregations often vast numbers of immensely capable people who... Uh, just need to be, you know, encouraged and set loose. And again, I'll say your book is is one of the things that can really help people do that. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to to make this available to folks. So uh, let me in, encourage people again. If you want to sort of continue to learn uh, in the in the chat, you've got links. Or if you just remember the phrase Encore Curve, and you Google that, you can find. Andy's uh, material, and, and that can be really helpful to you, or you might want to do it with a small group or with your Sunday school class or whatever. Um, also, I just should mention that we at the Dupree Center are creating lots of resources uh, to serve folk in the third third of life. And so if you go to Dupree.org, D-E-P-R-E-E, Dupree.org, and then just look in the top uh, nav bar for third third, you'll, you'll find all kinds of stuff that we have available for you. Um, and we would love to hear from you, to learn from you, uh, find ways to partner with you. This is going to be something we're going to be doing together, and I'm, I'm excited for it. So, Andy, it was great to have you with us today. Thank you for- I've, I've loved this, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. You have, uh, we, we got a bunch of, uh, we got learned wisdom from your earned wisdom, <laughs> and that was great. So- uh, anyway, uh, folks, um, thank you so much for joining us. And we will do we do webinars like this periodically. We'll have more coming up, but we're we're thrilled to be uh, be able to serve you and be in partnership with you. So, uh, anyway, blessings to you all, and uh, thanks everyone. You you folks have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.